Hey everybody, welcome back. Hey, it's on. Anyway, you can tell by the car in front of me here, we are talking about Martin Truex Jr. Got this autographed to Kansas a while back. Figured it's a good time to break it out of the box so I could show it off a little bit because I'm kind of proud of it. Uh, put a different right rear tire or left rear tire on. This one originally comes with no left rear tire, I believe, because I added this and I love it. Anyway, Let's get into it. So we're talking about Sonoma today. Um, a fairly, I don't know what I want to call this race. It is eye-opening. Eye-opening is the word. So what am I talking about? Why am I saying it's eye-opening? All right, let's start with, let's just start from the very, very beginning. Okay, right off the bat, Denny Hamlin on the pole. The Toyotas are fast. I mean, they were literally were the top five cars for about the first 20 laps of a run. Um, AJ started to move up in the middle, as did Michael McDowell, um, and that was kind of all you could see. Uh, some of the other ones would fade. Reddick and Gibbs started to fade later in the run, uh, so they would they fell back a little bit more. Um, and at the time, Larson and Elliott were running around ninth and tenth, maybe eighth and ninth, um, coming up to the end of stage one. So coming to the end of stage one, Truex does get by Denny Hamlin, I believe, right. No, he didn't pass until after stage one. So Denny Hamlin gets the uh, stage win. Um, but right before the end of that stage, Chase pits from 8th or ninth, And uh, as does Larson, they pit on the same lap from 8th and ninth position. They run about three laps. And then the leaders all pit with, you know, literally they get their stage points and they come in to pit the very next lap. Okay, so they come in and pit the very next lap. And then um, after they make that pit stop, uh, Truex then goes right after Hamlin on the fresh tires. He's, he is digging. He's going to try and get there. And, um, they come out of the pits and Elliot comes out in third position, third and fourth for Elliot and Larson. They gain a ton of spots. The tire fall off is about two seconds at that point. So they were able to gain about six seconds of track time and probably a little bit in the pits as well. But by the time it was all said and done, they came out third and fourth. So they track, they jumped a lot of track position, um, which was cool. It was good to see strategy playing a factor road course racing again, where you want to jump short pit or undercut as the F1 people call it. Uh, they undercut them in the pits, and with the fresh tires, they were able to gain ground and gain that track position. Um, so, after they came out, uh, Truex does take the lead. Bell works his way past both Elliott and Larson, and I believe Larson was battling with a couple of different guys um, for 5th, 6th, and 7th. They were kind of all jumbled up there. And that was when we hit our first caution of the day. Somewhere around lap, I want to say it was around lap 50-ish, with like five or six to go in the stage. And look, this is where my first bullet point of the day is. NASCAR race control is a joke. That that caution was a joke. And I'm sorry to the people defending it saying, hey, what are they supposed to do? Walk out on pit road and get it? Yes, that is the answer. Yes, that's the answer. Yes, walk out on pit road and grab the tire. Um, look, this is not an active racetrack. There is a controlled speed on pit road of like 30 miles an hour. It's literally like walking out into the street to pick up your Frisbee in town. You know, I, I, I mean, seriously, just look both ways and go pick it up. It doesn't even take that long. You literally can run out there, pick it up and roll it into your box, and it'll probably take you a grand total of four seconds. I'm not kidding. It would not have taken any time for them to clear that. I cannot believe NASCAR thought that was a valid caution. All they would have had to do, have an official go get it. I don't care. Have a crew guy go get it. All you have to do is simply warn the spotters. Just, I mean, they literally have race control for a reason. Race control can just say, there is a tire in the middle of pit road. Drivers attempting to pit, use caution. Okay? And this is why it frustrates you. I watched IndyCar last week. Pato Ward stalled his car on the outset of pit road. He was sitting at the exit of pit road, stuck out there. And they let the team run all the way down pit road pick the car up with the jack, and drag it back to the pit box. Under green, by the way. This is this is not them running two feet outside the box. They ran all the way to the exit of the pit lane, all the way right there, smack dab in the middle of the exit of pit lane, and drag him out of the way because they didn't want to throw the yellow for something so stupid. NASCAR race control has got to learn this. I, I understand a lot of people were getting bored, and they were getting, I don't know what the word would be, annoyed I, I don't know but that was a stupid caution because what it did unfortunately for guys like Denny Hamlin Kyle Larson Chase Elliott Michael McDowell it ruined all of their races now some of them recovered to still get quality finishes but it ruined all of their days and 
for it to be on such a bogus excuse of a yellow, I have a problem with that. I don't understand why NASCAR always has – why do they always make the wrong call? It's not that difficult. You know, if you see a car – I'm using this specifically from my example – Kansas, a car was literally trying to pull off the racetrack and the, the literally the tail of the truck was sticking out from the wall. I'm talking on the very inside of the track at the very exit of pit road at Kansas. Go look it up. 2021 Kansas truck race. Go look at why that race finished with a green white checker. It's crap. Okay, go look that up. So the reason I'm telling you to look it up is because I'm saying we've seen this before. Just remember, guys, at Kansas, a wheel sat in the in the grass for like 15 laps and they didn't need to throw a caution. And that's when there's no wall. So nobody could go out and get it because it was in the grass and it was gr a green racetrack at the very end of pit road where someone literally legitimately could have actually spun into it. Like that's a legitimate caution there because you don't want a crew guy running out in the grass during green flag conditions at 150 miles an hour. Now, if you have a pit road wall like Pocono, like Indy, like Gateway, like Sonoma, I have no problem with going out and getting the tire. There's a wall protecting you from the green flag portion of the racetrack where cars are moving at high speeds. You just have to watch out for the cars at 30 miles an hour, which, like I said, that's in town speeds. That's looking both ways before you cross the street. So, again, inexcusable caution. I understand. I don't understand. I, I'm sorry. I'm not giving NASCAR a break on this. They wanted the yellow, so they made an excuse for it. And this is what I was afraid of. NASCAR has this problem where they think, oh, the show's getting sort of dull. We, we got to spice it up. No, you don't. Just let it play out. It was a chess match. I was watching strategy on a much more methodical level that they haven't gotten to do for so many years because of this garbage called stage racing. And then the strategy gets ripped all to shreds because they're like, oh, there's a tire on pit road. It's like, really? On pit road? So yeah, garbage yellow, we'll, I have a problem with that. But what happened after that? So nine cars stay out. They had all recently pitted within the last eight laps. And Truex wins the battle off pit road. He's the first car with brand new tires. Um, so Truex and McDowell start making their way up through the field. They were the first two guys to kind of get through on those new tires and get to the front. The rest of everybody else on the new tires got stuck. And I mean stuck. Guys on 10 lap older tires just Nobody could pass. And that's the story of the day. No one could pass. You had to be Martin Truex Jr. level fast to pass. And Martin wasn't that. I mean, he was fast. But his lap times weren't insane. He was very aggressive where he needed to be, which is into the two braking zones. And he would really stick his nose in there and just get someone out of position, which was enough to then make the move throughout the rest of the corner. And so hats off to Martin. He did a great job today of moving through the field by just using... His breaks to put people in bad positions. Just, you know, I'm not, he wasn't going to make the pass in some of the corners, but he got him on the wrong lane moving into the next corner, which would allow him to get up alongside him. So, he, very good driving today from Truex. But for the rest of the field, man, this car has some problems. I mean, you had cars on, I mean, look at Chase Elliott at the end of the race, 12 lap older tires, and he held off Christopher Bell for five laps. I mean, got like, Good job on Chase for driving that way, but you know if you're uh, if you're most abrasive racetrack, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, if your most abrasive racetrack um, has twelve lap older tires, I mean Darlington, he would have gone right by. Sonoma's a longer racetrack; it should be even worse, but it wasn't because for some reason these tires are just way, way, way too hard. Um, so again. Uh, due to those issues, like, you know, everyone else got stuck in place. Um, so then the next cycle of green flag stops comes around. Everyone's kind of going through their pit stop. Chase Elliott, Kevin Harvick, and I want to say Daniel Suarez stay out long. They're going to try and run this thing out as long as they can to just hope for a, hope for something to happen. Well, as, as it may happen, something happened. So uh, the problem was, and I'm going to bring this up because a lot of people said – you know, basically hats off to Alan Gustafson for trying some strategy. I am not going to do that. And here's why. And I understand this is, you know, Monday morning quarterback type stuff, but I said it when it happened. I was sitting on my couch. Yeah, that's right. Sitting on my couch. And when I saw him come into pit, I immediately said, what are you doing? Are you kidding me? You could, you literally, I, because I, I was watching fuel windows today because I thought it was fun. I love strategy racing. And he had the ability to go eight 
to 10 more laps, and they pitted him early. And I don't understand why. If you're gambling for the win, go for it. This is where Alan Gustafson has driven me nuts for years. He half-asses his strategies, and it drives me up a wall. If you're going to stay out long, stay out long, like you did with Josh Berry at Richmond. You stayed out to the last possible second, and you caught the break right when you needed to. You didn't wait 10 laps and then say, oh, they're giving up too much time. we got to go now. It's like, no, you have to see the strategy through. You have to literally lay it on the line of it's all or nothing. Because he did it as a it's something or maybe something kind of nice. No, you have to go all or nothing. And he should have stayed out those extra 8 to 10 laps. Why? That caution that came out maybe wouldn't have saved him the lead. But if he had already pitted, he'd only have two laps on his tires. And if he hadn't pitted, he's pitting with the leaders in the front four with brand new tires. So at the end of the day, that was where my real frustration grew is that he had the, uh, the potential to run that sucker out and literally have maybe two to three lap old tires that he would have stood a fighting chance against Truex on versus 12 lap old tires, which you weren't holding Truex off for that. I mean, he was lucky to hold on to fifth at that point. But again, it was the right strategy call. He just didn't stay aggressive enough. And like I said, that's what's driven me nuts for years. When you are in this system where wins matter more than anything, going on a strategy like that was the right call. But you have to go for it. Go all the way out for it. You can't drop the strategy early because everyone's so much faster than you. Your gamble isn't about them being faster than you. It's about having fresh tires when a caution comes out. And when you only have, you know, 10 lap fresher tires versus... 20 lap fresher tires, that's a big gap. That's what you want. So that frustrated me. But anyway, so let's move past that because like I said, as a Chase fan, that drove me nuts today to have to watch everyone talking about how great Alan Gustafson's call was when I'm sitting there like, dude, he literally had the shot to potentially win the race with the right call, but he chickened out and went to pit road early. Now, again, I'm not involved in all the stuff at the team. I'm not trying to rip a guy that way. I'm saying it drives me nuts when guys, and this is an Xfinity any series, when if you're going to stay out long and go for the strategy, then just go for it, you know? So that's my thing. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's late race restart. Kyle Busch and Martin Truex Jr. get around um, around Chase and get to the lead. And after that, Martin Truex Jr. sets sail, moves on. He's the best car all day. He deserved to win the race. No issues there. Um, Kyle Busch comes home second. Christopher Bell third. Uh, Chris Buescher, great run, gets back up to fourth. Chase Elliott fifth. And then, um, trying to remember. Oh, no, sorry. Joey Logano ends up third. Joey Logano ends up third, then Busher, then Elliott, then Bell. Bell ends up in sixth. Um, now, the other one I was going to mention, Ryan Blaney caught that caution really, really well. He did stay out long and had only four laps on his tires. And unfortunately for Ryan Blaney, his car was not good all day. And then after that, he also got run over like three times. So he got spun twice and just couldn't. I mean, Ryan Blaney couldn't hit the broadside of a barn today. It was bad. So he um, got spun twice and ends up ending the last car in the lead lap. Tyler Reddick also had stayed out. He had a tire issue. Um, we're going to talk about that real quick because Tyler Reddick has this tire issue. And instead of limping around the track and causing a caution because of the tire eventually shredding into pieces or parking because he can't drive it, he hooks a left, or sorry, hooks a right uh, in turn 12 instead of a left and goes back around into the pit road, which everyone saw it happen and said, wow, that was a great idea because he, he kept NASCAR from having to throw a caution. That's good. That's a good thing to do. He went backwards. But safely, you know, he went backwards in a safe way to get to pit road and let the race stay green and let it play out naturally. And NASCAR rewards him by penalizing him and giving him a drive through. Now, I don't understand the reason for that. The idea that, well, the rule book clearly states, I don't care what the rule book states. This is why you have to be able to make a call in race. You have to be able to look at that and say, well, right, the rule book didn't take into account that the guy is doing this to avoid ruining the race by causing another yellow that's just unnecessary. So instead of penalizing, we're going to let this one go because of this. We're going to we're going to use the entire situation to make a decision. No, no, no. We're going to penalize him anyway because, well, technically it was an improper pit entrance and that's all we need. I mean, really, guys? The guy has a flat tire. What the heck do you expect him to do? You want him to limp all the way around that road course, throwing debris and causing a caution? That's stupid. Don't encourage guys to do that. So, bad call on NASCAR race control again. Shocker. Um, by penalizing Reddick, because that was just stupid. Like, Reddick did a great thing. That was a good job on Tyler Reddick, saving us from having to have utter calamity in the final two laps with a bunch of green-white checkers and crashes that, you know, let's be honest, it gets old. Coda got old. 
Indy got old. When these guys just go in and pile into each other, it gets old. And so being able to keep that race green was really, really nice. Um, so yeah, big time miss there. But then, as I said, Truex comes, in, comes around, wins the race. Good on him. Uh, the only thing I had to touch on left after this, because like I said, I, I did have this long rant going. Um, he does a burnout for like a minute straight, and the tire doesn't even go flat. Um, I've made this observation in a number of tracks where these guys do these long, kind of ridiculous burnouts, and they don't even flatten their tires. Now, I understand that, like, not every race can be a blowout, but these tires are way too damn hard. You cannot tell me that at North Wilkesboro, Kyle Larson could do a burnout the entire length of the racetrack, and all of his tires are still up. That's ridiculous. Goodyear has got to soften these tires up. No wonder there's no tire fall-off. I mean, there was tire fall-off today of two seconds, but at road course, you should have like six seconds of fall-off. Um, so the, the fall-off problem is literally just Goodyear's putting way too hard a tire on these cars, and they have got to soften it up. You know, the rain tires are softer, and they put on a great show at, um, at Wilkesboro. So maybe we just start using those. I don't know, but man... I'm just saying, like, this is getting ridiculous. These guys should not be able to do a burnout the entire length of a track, or in Truex's case, just hammer the gas down, and not even flat spot the tires. Like, are you serious? He burned everything off of them, and they still didn't go flat. Now, I'm not saying I want flat tires, but I'm saying you need that soft tire to create better racing. You need it to be able to heat up and wear out so that the guys who take care of their tires have the chance to move forward. So... Overall today, the best way I would put it is today's race was a um, adequately mediocre race. Slightly above average, I would say, or maybe just at average. It's, a, it's an okay race. There's nothing wrong with the race. Now, the racing on track needs work. Sure. Race control needs work. But we didn't have calamity. We didn't have anyone get hurt. We didn't have any clown shows. So you know what? In the modern age of NASCAR, if we can avoid calamity, we can avoid clown shows, and we can avoid looking like idiots... That's a pretty good day. So, gonna say it's a solid day still, but like I said, still, this truck, truck, this car has work to be done on it, and it's evident. It's very evident. These these road course races, we put six of them on the schedule, and for this car to be so bad at them, there ain't gonna, the six road courses will not stay on this schedule if they can't fix the racing. So, yeah, drop some horsepower, you know, narrow the tire, soften the tire. Let's let's make some moves, but something's got to get done cuz as as bad as the race was from the racing standpoint, considering how much tire fall off there are, I am very worried for um for Indy. I mean, th that is not a track that tends to lend itself to a lot of movement if all the tires are the same. So, let's hope that they can put some softer stuff on there and make some adjustments. But um, like I said, for this week, perfectly, perfectly slightly above average or average. So nothing wrong with it. But like I said, I do have to complain about those few things because I thought too many people were letting some of that stuff slide. And you, NASCAR is supposed to be professionals. I, I'm going to hold them to a standard of a professional racing. This is not your local dirt track where, you know, uh, Billy Bob Joe is running the show with his with his son, and that's it. And everyone's sort of chaotic. This is a professional enterprise. This is a you know multi billion dollar company. They got to be better than this. So anyway, guys, let me know your thoughts on the Toyota Save Mart 350 uh, in the comments below. I'm definitely curious to have the discussion on how that stuff, how you guys thought of it. Uh, I like I said, thought it was you know perfectly average or adequate. Um, but let me know what you noticed and your observations of the day, because it's definitely a good conversation. Anyway, guys, thank you all for watching. I hope you have enjoyed, and I hope you enjoyed the little intro. Um, that'll wrap it up. We'll see you later today in the next DieCast Review.